I met my girlfriend at a party one night. She seemed like a total daredevil type of chick who grabbed life by the horns. The night I met her, she jumped off of the roof of the house into the pool. This instantly caught my attention and I was immediately attracted to her. I quickly took my shot and started talking to her. We got along really well right off the bat and things started heating up quickly in no time. We would go on adventures all the time and it was great, until it wasn't. We'd been together for eight months at this point when I started questioning what was really going on. There were multiple times when we went on an adventure and I felt like she almost got me killed. At first, I thought I was being paranoid, but over time, it became more of an occurrence on her part. For example, we went hiking on a rocky and dangerous trail with a huge drop off. If anyone fell off of the side, they'd definitely be toast. At one point when I was making it across, she ran up and tried to push me. Thankfully, I saw her in the corner of my eye and duck so that she'd miss, but I was shocked. She started laughing and acting like it was a huge joke. I was genuinely terrified, but I moved past it because I thought she had a dark, twisted sense of humor. There's no way she'd actually try to push me, right? Well, my theory was definitely solidified when we went hunting together. She has expertise in this area as she grew up doing it, but I've only been a few times. At one point, she literally aimed the rifle at me from afar. When I yelled at her to stop and started freaking out, she had the craziest smile I've ever seen on her face. It was almost like a switch flipped. I really thought she was going to go through with it until another hunter in the area heard me yelling and came to see what was up. When she realized someone else was around, she quickly changed her aim and once again laughed it off like it was a big joke. After this, I knew I needed to get away from her and end the relationship. However, most of my things were still at her apartment and I didn't know how to go about it because because at this point, I wasn't sure what she'd do. Part two, I think my girlfriend is trying to unalive me. I borrowed her apartment key while she was at work and quickly grabbed all my things, including my laptop that I had let her use for school. When I got on it, I was shocked at what I found. There were a bunch of websites I didn't recognize, but after visiting them, I was terrified. She had frequented websites that included a lot of gore and death. From what I could tell, she was particularly interested in acts of torture and so on. She had even Googled different ways to make unaliving someone look like a complete accident. Additionally, there were also Google searches for how to fake certain emotions and empathy. Shortly after going through all of this, I got a text from her asking where I was and why I had taken all my things. I wasn't sure if I should go all in about the things I thought or if I should play it Cool. I had a bad feeling that this girl was dangerous and I didn't want to just let her think that she was safe to keep doing these things. I confronted her and told her about everything I found. I also told her what I think she's been doing in our relationship. At first, she tried to defend herself and once again, act like it was all a joke. However, when she realized I wasn't buying it, she got angry. That's when she started spewing threats and told me that she should have pushed me off of the cliff on our hike. After this, I started ignoring her text, but she kept blowing me up. Her texts were getting even more aggressive. I decided I'd deal with it the next day and went to bed. However, at 2 a.m., I heard banging on my apartment door. I could tell that it was her. I could hear her angered breathing behind the door and she wasn't leaving. I called the police and had her arrested for harassment. That's when I also made a police report about everything I had found and turned it over to the police. The last time I saw her was when I was granted a restraining order against her in court because she started stalking me. The judge also sentenced her to mandatory therapy after all the evidence was brought forth. Ever since then, I've moved far away and I always watch my back. A few months ago, my boyfriend Blake and I went out to brunch with some of our friends. After a few mimosas, my close friend Jackie started talking about how she's been making a lot of extra money lately by making content on OnlyFans. A few of the other girls in the group started talking about it and asking Jackie about how much she's making off of it. Blake chimed in after a while and began asking Jackie a bunch of questions as well. He asked her what her content is like and how many videos she's made so far. At first, I didn't think anything of it because I was a little curious too. However, then he started to get a little too interested. He started recommending certain things she should do in her videos to sell more and get more people to watch and subscribe. This was the first red flag. He then asked her what name she came up with or what she goes by on OnlyFans, which to me sounded like he was trying to find her account to check it out later. I gave him a dirty look and he caught on quick and stopped talking about it. I felt a little uncomfortable and planned on talking to him about it later, but I ultimately decided to let it go because I thought I was being insecure. A few weeks later, we hung out with Jackie again when we went downtown with some friends. At one point in the night, Blake asked Jackie about her OnlyFans and how it was going. She smiled at him and told him that it's going great. I also noticed throughout the night he kept staring at her for long periods of time. After that night, I was suspicious and decided that I was going to do some detective work. Needless to say, I couldn't believe what I found. One of the craziest and most chilling stories I've heard is about Christopher Dunch, aka Dr. Death. He earned that nickname because most of the people he operated on ended up severely maimed or dead. Out of the 38 people he operated on, he left 31 of them seriously disfigured and even killed two of them. In one instance, Dr. Death accidentally operated on the wrong part of a patient's back, leaving the patient in excruciating pain. Dr. Death, being the nice guy that he was, offered to give the patient a second operation to fix it. I don't know about you guys, but there's no way I would ever let this guy near me again after making a mistake like that. However, this patient gave him the green light and this time he botched the surgery again, leaving the patient paralyzed from the waist down. In another patient, he cut a ligament that shouldn't have been touched, screwed in hardware in the wrong spot, and stripped the screw so the hardware couldn't be removed. An assisting surgeon was so disturbed by Dr. Death's actions during this operation that he had to physically restrain him to prevent him from causing any more damage to the patient. He may have been under the influence while performing the surgery. Dr. Death even maimed one of his close friends that came in for an operation by removing tons of muscle tissue, leaving his friend a quadriplegic. Other surgeons in the area that attempted to fix his botched 
surgery stated that he messed up some of these people so badly, it almost looked like he did it intentionally. A fellow surgeon accused him of being a crazed maniac and claimed that he was trying to decapitate one patient after severing his vocal cord, slicing a hole in his esophagus, cutting an artery, and embedding a surgical sponge in his throat. Despite all of this, hospitals continued to hire Dr. Death and his rampant of insane botched surgeries continued. I'm just scratching the surface and highlighting some of Dr. Death's story. Luckily, there's a new series based on the true events streaming now that I've been binge-watching. Tune in and stream Dr. Death on Peacock TV to hear about what happens to Dr. Dunch and his other patients. The tea is piping hot and there's a lot more to be spilled. I met a guy that I really like. His name is Austin. We've been dating for about seven months now. We really hit it off and things were going great. We decided to move in together because it made sense financially and we believed that we'd love living together. At first, we did. However, I now know why people say you never truly know someone until you live together. There's a few things that he does that drive me crazy. First of all, he hates to clean. I know the same can be said for a lot of guys, but Austin takes it to the next level. I've gone on him several times about doing the dishes. Instead of washing them, he'll try to be sneaky and throw away the dirty dishes altogether so he doesn't have to clean them or hear me complain. He claims it was an accident, but I found my mugs in place in the trash multiple times. He threw away my favorite mug that I got from Disneyland because it had caked on cereal on it and it would be hard to clean. To me, that's just next level lazy and makes no sense. The next thing I caught him doing that blew my mind and disgusted me at the same time is when he plays video games in the living room and instead of going to the bathroom, he'll just pee in an empty bottle and then screw the cap on and leave it there. He's never done this in front of me, but I'll find bottles full of urine sitting on the counter by the couch because he can't even dispose of them on his own later. The bathroom is literally just a few steps away, but I find bottles full of pee all the time. Not only is it gross, but it's highly unsanitary. However, this isn't even the worst of it. Part 2. I can't stand my boyfriend after moving in together. Throwing away my dishes and peeing in bottles is pretty lazy and gross, but not as bad as the next problem and it's a big one. In the bathroom, after he goes number 2, sometimes he'll throw his used toilet paper in the trash can instead of flushing it, causing the bathroom to reek. He'll also throw used wet wipes in the trash can as well for the ultimate sewer smell. It grosses me out so much and I can't believe he does this. Sometimes when I'm working overtime and haven't gotten a chance to clean as much as I'd like, he'll just keep adding on to it until it topples over and falls on the ground. Oh, and he leaves the toilet seat up each and every time. He also can't cook, throws his things around everywhere and won't pick up after himself, and rarely takes out the trash. I've tried to talk to him multiple times about these issues, but he seems to just brush it off and it keeps happening. He acts like I'm being a pest or I'm the annoying one when I bring up these issues. We have three more months on our lease together, but I'm already looking for a way out. I'm not sure if we should live separately and continue dating or if I should just end it. When we weren't living together, I was so happy and even thought for a second that he could be the one. I really like him, but I don't think I could ever live with him again after this. Do all men live like this? Am I being overdramatic? What should I do? Story time about how I intercepted a kidnapping with my pee. I was working as a pizza delivery driver and was having a really busy night, non-stop back and forth without any time to even take a bathroom break. We were going through a bit of a heat wave in our area, so I had also been drinking copious amounts of water. All of a sudden, as I was driving to this particular delivery, the urge to go hit me like a ton of bricks. Thankfully, I was close to the customer so I could get this one over with quickly or so I thought. I pulled up to the house and it was in an area I'd delivered to before so I could immediately tell that something wasn't right. All the lights were off in the house, not even the glow of a television or anything. It was extra apparent because the street light closest to the door happened to be out of order and to top it all off, the block was dead quiet. This is a big university area and obviously there aren't many student renters in July but there had to be at least one person because someone ordered this pizza. It was scorching that night even after sundown. My car's AC is a joke and the piping hot pizzas don't help things much. I called the customer and the voice on the other end sounded out of breath saying, yeah? I said, hey, it's your pizza out from but there doesn't appear to be anybody home? Then the customer replies, still gasping for air. Yeah, I'm not home. At this point, I felt like my bladder was about to burst and I was much less patient than I'd usually be with a customer right out of the gate, so I replied, well, then we're going to have to terminate the order because I've arrived in the state of delivery window and you were supposed to pay in cash, so I don't know what to tell you. Plan ahead next time. I instantly regretted letting my bladder do the talking for me as the voice on the other end came through more clearly as a young, bubbly, and very distraught girl who couldn't have been older than her 20s. She apologized over and over, saying that she lost track of time at work but knew I was coming and she's literally running home right now. She followed up with, Please don't leave. I'm starving and don't have a car. Seriously, please don't leave. Five minutes tops, okay? I know what it's like to be hungry, running late, have no car, and not live near any restaurants. Plus, hearing her voice remind me of the last few times I delivered here and she'd always been so nice. I felt bad for snapping at her and tried to walk it back while simultaneously looking for potential spots to pee. I apologized to her and told her no rush and that I'd see her when she got there. I started scouting for places to pee, but all the houses were close together and offered no clumps or trees or anything. It was at emergency level now and I had to do something. The safest bet was to use the bush in front of the woman's house. She wasn't home and the streetlight was out so no one would see me. I went to the biggest cluster of bushes to avoid splatter and released. After the initial millisecond of relief, I noticed the sound was way off, more like peeing on something solid than something leafy. I couldn't make out what it was in the darkness, but all of a sudden, I heard a deep voice exclaiming, What the fuck? Before I could turn around, thinking I had been caught by a neighbor, a man came leaping out of the bushes.
Part 2. How I intercepted a kidnapping with my pee. The guy in the bushes blew by me, brushing off my golden shower. He spit emphatically on the ground, so I think I got him right in the face. I didn't see where he went after a few paces, but the next part was a bit of a blur. I remember hearing a car screech out after a minute. I got in some night vision at this point, so I was able to make out his general features. I was in shock and stood there trying to figure out what happened. My mind was searching for a reasonable explanation that could make sense of why that man was hiding in the bushes. I started coming up with reasons, but my inner voice was screaming, Bruh, that man was wearing a hoodie in 90 degree weather. That was a bad man. You're in a bad situation. I still try to make sense of it and flash my phone light into the bushes. That's when I saw a bag slightly splashed with pee. This was going to make it all make sense. Once I opened it, I saw a sharp knife, a roll of duct tape, and a bottle of pills. This is when all the delusions broke and my fight or flight kicked in. I dropped the bag, got in my car, and booked it. I called the police and frantically explained everything. The dispatcher was able to calm me down and said he was sending out units. That's when I got a text from the customer. Hey, I'm here, but I don't see you. I was overwhelmed with guilt and rushed back to her house with my heart pounded out of my chest. When I got there, I waved her down and flashed my lights. She bounced over to my car, all happy-go-lucky. I kept whispering, get in, get in. And she was like, get it? Huh? You want me to get the pizza from the back? I quickly replied, there was a man in your bushes. I'm on the phone with police. I don't know where he went. Please get in the car so we can lock the doors. The police came soon after and took our statements. It turns out the reason she got into my car without probing any deeper is because she knew who the man was right away from my description. She had an abusive ex-boyfriend who was apparently psychotic enough that he immediately came to mind from hearing there's a guy in your bushes she later called us to thank me and insisted on leaving a huge tip but our manager refused and promised that the next time we see her we'd load her up with enough one free pie cards to last a lifetime it was easily the scariest thing that's ever happened to me on or off the job I feel like I'm always being asked to do a natural look and I think that I finally mastered it so let's get into it I already did my skincare routine so now I'm gonna use the Juno miracle cream and some sunscreen now I'm using the Charlotte Tilbury flawless filter and this is supposed to be super light coverage I'm going for that look where the main character wakes up in the movies and they just look really natural and pretty. I don't look like that when I wake up. I look like a zombie. Props to the girls who wake up and they just look flawless like that because I am jelly. This is really glowy. I thought it was going to accentuate my pores. I thought I wasn't going to like it, but I actually really like this. It actually doesn't accentuate my pores and it just gives you a really glowy, dewy look. And if you don't like that glowy look, you can always go in with setting powder. Look how glowy that is. I feel like a Twilight Vampire. I'm shining. I don't know about y'all, but I got some dark designer bags under my eyes. So I'm going in with the Kosas Concealer. I usually use Tarte, but I felt like it would be too full coverage and it wouldn't blend in well with this foundation. I usually don't put it under my eyebrows, but I haven't waxed my brows and I need to hide those hairs. <laughs> People in the comments sometimes ask what the darkness around my eyes is and it's just natural discoloration and also I don't really sleep well or a lot so that adds to it. I like the discoloration I have on my actual eyelid because it sometimes looks like eyeshadow and I've been asked by people what eyeshadow color I'm wearing. I'm just like oh that that's discoloration by G sorry it's an exclusive. I'm gonna use my wet n wild setting powder with my fluffy brush for under my eyes. See the difference? I have to do contour for my round ass face, so we're gonna go in with Juvia's Abby John. And this is just their foundation stick. I use it as a contour stick. And I'm just gonna blend it in with my fluffy brush. I like to start higher up on my um, cheekbone because it gives that lifted look. Usually people will start down here. If you want a more lifted look, start higher up. Next, I'm going to move on to my eyebrows, and I'm going to use the Refi Brow Gel. If you're going for that laminated look and want your brows to stick in place, this is it. This is it. One thing about being Middle Eastern is that you grow hair like crazy. It's kind of a gift and a curse because I have really thick and hairy eyebrows, but I have hair everywhere. There are places that you wouldn't think hair would grow, and it grows. Is that TMI? <laughs> Sorry about it. Okay, for my eyelashes, I'm going to just curl them and then use the There Will by Benefit Mascara. And it's so good for lengthening while not clumping. I feel like my eyelashes used to be a lot thicker and fuller, but I used to get eyelash extensions. And anyone who gets eyelash extensions starts with light, but makes their way somehow to a volume. And your girl was getting mega volume for like a whole year. So a lot of my lashes fell off. And you know it's dark in the deep And it's so, so hard to keep We just gotta keep sailing Tired of waiting Clouds are fading And 
our visions getting clearer We can see the land appearing far away Winds are blowing And they're guiding our direction We're not losing our momentum Going straight The moon is rising Shining light into our darkness And on everything around us Could it be That we made it Through the hardest of mistakes We got nothing left to say It's you and me Say 